Good evening and welcome everybody. Great to see so many people on screen and in the, in the live office. Uh, we've got uh, five performers here, which is going to be amazing. It's going to be a wonderful night. Um, we are really sad that our lovely Roz Hone, who normally does the hosting, is not very well, so she's not able to be here. Although I think I might have seen her watching, which would be lovely if she is. Um, so I'm going to step in and host. I'm Jill Swan, and um, I'm very excited to uh, be introducing this special version of the Poetry and Spoken Word Night, um, which is going to feature members of the GFMA Writers Group. So um, it's going to be a wonderful evening. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the Writers Group, um, that we've been going for about, well, over 10 years. Um, not necessarily all the same people, but um, it's carried on and on. And we all seem to really enjoy it. Um, how it works is that uh, we have a topic and then everybody can write in, in any kind of writing, any genre on that topic. Um, we've had some really weird and wonderful topics like baggy trousers, obsession was our last one, and um, we've had green, all sorts of things, you name it, we've done it really. We've done religion, <laughs> we've done everything, and we're still going. And um, at the end of each session, we choose, we take it in turns to choose a new subject. So um, I will be introducing people reading from the writing that we've done in the group, and some people will be bringing their own writing, whichever they want. So I'm going to start the evening by reading two poems that I've written. And... Um, True to what I've just said, this was the first one was on the subject of fish. And um, this poem is about fish in Newlyn Harbour. It's about a memory that I had as a child. And here it goes. A blustery winter's day, iron cold sea and relentless waves crashing against the harbour walls. Behind these, many sombre coloured fishing boats sway restlessly at their moorings, jostling each other impatiently, riggings whirring wildly in the wind. Huge crates of fish lifted lugubriously by rust-coloured cranes. Fishermen in bright yellow sou'westers carefully guide them onto the flagstoned quayside, providing the only source of colour in the dim light. Pile upon pile of silver fish, shimmering and twitching, slithering and flailing in vast containers waiting for collection. The stench is overpowering, whilst overhead, raucous, sharp-eyed seagulls swoop and call, hoping for the chance of a meal. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, this next one is... Another one about a place, but this, this time it's Night Streets by the Thames. And I think that our topic was Night Streets this time. Narrow and winding, bordered by rambling buildings, occasional blocks of flats and glimpses of the swirling river. Hooded street lamps, spaced erratically, illuminate infrequent passers-by with mottled beams. A dog walker rushing past, a couple hand in hand, absorbed in conversation. A group of raucous drinkers heading home after a night out, briefly disturbed a peaceful scene, then disappear into the darkness like colourful fish in a murky pond. Murmurs of the river splashing against the wharf at high tide. Seagulls and terns screeching, their sounds echoing in the gloom. Ghosts of horses and carts that once clattered the worn, uneven cobblestones, easily imagined. Spectres of Thames barges, clashing of cargo, lifted by crane and winch into warehouses now silenced. As the river flows past on its timeless journey, 
past, present and future merge in the flickering twilight. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all the other members of the group. And um, just to remind you, like Ros does when she's hosting, that um, please do use the, the comment facility on, if you're on Zoom, because it's nice for people to have feedback. So I'd like to welcome Emily Sherris. Um, She has been coming to the Writers' Group for a very long time and um, she is an amazing writer, so talented um, in lots of different genres and I can't wait to hear what she's going to do tonight. Thank you, Jill. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to read uh, a few poems for you this evening. The first one is inspired by a walk that I took uh, along the Thames um, from uh, Greenwich to Woolwich and it's called A Riverside Walk to Woolwich. I walk up the slope and turn right, my fan and sword cocooned in their case, a sentient tarot card. Tate and Lyle, a capitalist exhibitionist, gazes across at me and I think about a sweet moment when my nan told me that her father had worked there when he was younger. Walking further down the river, I see an old boat, deep brown and partly hidden, its scrawniness visible above the surface, conjuring up discomfort in the cyclists, runners and martial artists that go by. Three men have circled a bench like wild jaguars. They play loud music, and it is only when I come down the stairs with the languorous railing that I see this pack car anglers. I have a feeling they do not return the fish. Coots swim through a haven beneath a weather vane. The rosewood plain flies above me, passing by pillars and balconies the colour of lapis. Another man relaxes by the ferry. His murmured observation about combat moves over the broken mosaic and wild flowers, but does not affect me at all. Thank you. This next poem is called Obsession, um, and as Jill said, that was the theme for the last group. So, Obsession. Her WhatsApp picture is a masterpiece of Amazonian assertiveness that fills my screen again. She is half naked. The dark urchin's collarbone jeers at me when I am alone. It is a testament to how much my yearning has grown. My paranoia is a green circle that I watch as I imagine who else might desire an alter ego, obsess over your humour, black and penetrative like a crow. Last seen seven minutes ago. The little bottle of perfume crowned with a shamrock lid is beyond my reach. When I sit on a leech from beach, I can smell candied resentment. You had the gall to call her a peach. Like the child Ernest, I choked my face a heartbroken ugly fruit and disillusionment takes root. Uh, this next poem is called Fan Form and it's about um, a Tai Chi slash Kung Fu form. Statuesque in an exotic cream robe, she looks ahead, the dragons behind her, growling in her ear, scales rubbing her lobe, unfazed. The monsters are just an ochre blur. Soon she reveals her gorgeous blue fan. It is raised with finesse, halving her face. The chanting begins, and this talisman is waved above her head, fragile like lace. These six compelling sections are fluent, an odyssey of balance, cracks and glides. Her snake sweeps towards the ground, left wrist bent. Pink dahlias on show, they should not hide. Finishing, she bows with her fan between her hands. I want to achieve what I have seen. Thank you. Uh, this next poem is called Prague and it was inspired by a trip I took to Prague. 
I am in a square, your fridge magnet wet in my Macintosh pocket. I am hemmed in by ostentatious sculptures. The one in front of me is erotic, its burnished claw stretching towards a balcony, falling short of the yellow roses. I blend into the cerulean gates of a discreet synagogue. We are overlooked by explorers and friends we will always love. I am moved by a row of watering cans on the riverbank. Their pastel-coloured truth mirrors the sincerity in your shame. Some get painful feet, but mine are sifus that take me to the Rudolphinum, unlocking the red carpet. The goulash is a lullaby, its serenity embracing me as I wait in a damp basilica. Your silhouette looks up at the astronomical clock, intrigued by the cupolas, and I feel confused as my heart beats faster. Quicker. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, this is my last one. Okay, this is called Love and Beauty. Love in San Marino, Ipanema, warm rooms with bay windows, intricate Juliet balconies, lying together in windswept affection. Love for snaggletoothed beauty, an adoring lens that follows you through rocks on the beach, sliding down, amused with little finesse. Your face is pretty, wholesome. Love in a blue doorway, a damaged archway, the pointed foot and unrestrained arm gestures. Different bodies, same ballerina. Love in exotic togetherness. Love in a guidebook. The gift paired with an alluring but unachievable promise. The man with no interest in photos and film, of cotton dresses and woven velia, of clams in white wine, sun-dried tomato bread. He has never had the opportunity to preserve us, to plant, to paint a mountain, a renaissance beach for the person he loves. Never longed for that heartbreaking feeling that is so difficult to understand, the intimacy and beauty of our own world warming like hot blackberry tea on a Parisian terrace. When we stopped planning, when our synchronicity crumbled, when the perfume of failure settled in our space, I looked into their eyes and understood that there are only films, photos, emotions left, that I destroyed their love for me. Thank you. Oh, that was so beautiful. Thank you, Emily. Beautifully descriptive poems. Fantastic. Um, now, our next contributor is Andrew L. Boyd. And he's coming to us via Zoom, but he's not all that no. far away. He, he actually no. works and lives in Thamesmead. And um, he, he is a fantastic writer. Um, and um. he takes his inspiration from Thamesmead and the beautiful surroundings and the, you know, the people who live there. So yeah. looking forward to hearing what you're going to read tonight, Andrew. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much. Such, such kind words. Um, I've got four poems. Um, the first one I'm going to read is called The Path, and it's a, a poem about hope, about moving from uh, hopelessness to hope. The Path. The path leading to the hopelessness I felt was littered with unpleasant things. The years of separation from the girls is there. The absence of their names from a book I wrote is there. Feeling like the exemption, the act forget to mention is also there. But I plucked the smile from the sun one morning and placed it there. I put their I love you daddy at the end of a phone call there. I put the warmth of the dreams I have there. And when the daffodils made my friend smile, I put her smile there too. Next to the day the rain called and I answered the knocks of a thousand crystal fingers and went out into the morning and I wasn't worried about being ill and the rain remembered my childhood so I laid it flat on the path and straightened it too. Oh yes I did and learned this about the darkness. Even without an invitation, the light will always come. It will. It will. I promise you it will. That was the path.
Uh, the second one is called Reunion. And it's um, just talking about uh, a group of people reuniting. Um, that was me and the kids. <laughs> but yes, um, Reunion. Some weekends we'd pull out the blankets, pillows, all the cushions we could find and lay them on the living room floor. The four of us, bodies warmed by spicy chicken soup, would huddle to watch a film there. And most times the films would end up watching us. If those films could talk, they would be frank about the way we slept, arms and legs across each other, but happy to be together again, under the same roof, snoring. Thank you. Um, the next is called Afterwards. The Afterwards is, uh, it talks about the effect that um, abuse of one kind can have on someone. Um, afterwards. Afterwards, it took a lot to phase me. When I was insulted twice in the same week by the same man, Except for my ears, I couldn't tell where else on my body is words touch. But Mark, my faithful friend and an avid reader of psychology today, said it was abuse. That because I've been through so much, I've lost my sensitivity to it. He said I shouldn't let it continue. That's afterwards. And my, my last poem is called Now. Um, it's about grabbing the moment, uh, making the best of the present. It's living in the present. And this is a love poem. <laughs> it says, Now. How everything says goodbye. Falling leaves, sage fresh from my garden, flowers given and taken in love. That love you thought would last and last and last. There's this going and coming of things that neither the night with all its courage nor the day's beaming smile can ever escape. So my thoughts drift swiftly to you. And I remind myself that today may be all the time we have. And so, even now, eight hours later, I sit here. 7,000 miles away, loving you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was wonderful. And, um, you know, it, it's, they, your poetry is so um, inspiring and um, warm. And, um, you know, I love that it's about other human beings and and it describes things that we all experience and but yeah. it describes it so beautifully thank you so much thank you and now we have one of the newer members of the writers group and but a, a really amazing one and uh, her you. name is constanza maria she is lives and works around charlton and um She's bringing a new piece tonight, so I'm looking forward to hearing what that's going to be. Thank you, Chill. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I wrote a piece for our last topic obsession, and it's called The Queen's Obsession. She watches the show religiously every Monday evening as soon as the two weekly episodes are released. It is the highlight of her week. Who would have thought a Monday evening could be so special? At first, she was not sure she was going to like it. Never before had she seen a Korean drama, and the acting seemed rather strange to begin with. And there were annoying subtitles to read. However, not far into the first episode, she was hooked. And as time went on, she started to appreciate the foreign acting style and enjoy the sound of the Korean language. 
She had long forgotten she was reading subtitles alongside. Mm -hmm. As the weeks passed, the characters became her friends, her family even, and as the storyline of love and war, family and betrayal unfolded, it also became her own story. She was enthralled by its beauty, its depth. By now, she feels so much part of it, it's visceral. She has learned some Korean words and memorized her favorite costumes. To her, it feels as if she finally belongs, fits in, and is home. The more episodes she watches, the deeper she goes into this fantasy. And slowly, she becomes aware that the series is nearing its end. She wants to delay it, and yet she can't. She is compelled to keep watching each Monday night as the episodes arrive on screen. She wants to already line up the next series, but nothing seems even remotely up to par as she flicks through the many options. She knows it will hurt when it ends. It has touched an old pain inside her, a deep yearning to be loved and held and supported and safe. As the last episode draws to a close, she cries some real tears, not because the ending is sad, indeed it is a happy one, but not for her, not for her fantasy that she has come to rely on. Her fantasy that she is somehow part of this storyline has to die. Now comes the all familiar feeling of abandonment, desolation and despair. The characters were not really her friends, her family, her saviors. The story has ended and it wasn't real, but she is real and so are her feelings. She is grateful for the time she was able to spend in this fantasy land steeped in Korean culture so different from her own. Where people exist full of love and respect and honour and integrity. And she realises it has touched on a part of her own self that is capable of overcoming difficult struggles and displaying desirable characteristics. It seems she is rapidly approaching some important breakthrough in understanding her life, her own inner self. She feels it trying to break through the barrier from unconscious into consciousness, and it feels monumental, but also a bit scary, maybe almost a bit terrifying. She feels on the verge of a point of no return. Will she allow the insight into her true self to seep in, allow the revelation to take hold? She pauses for a moment, breathing into the space between knowing and not knowing. And then she immerses herself in a new series. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. I love that. That was amazing. Thank and, you so um, much. I think there's quite a few of us who come close to, well, being hooked on the series <laughs> anyway. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Oh, thank that's you. That's really great. <laughs> and next we have a, a writer who I really admire. Um, he puts so much research into the work that he does. And um, I know you're going to enjoy this abridged version of, of his original piece. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. So the theme this particular week was city. So um, I wrote about Spain. And because I always like to have my cake, I tried to get multiple cities into it. There was once a shady dame from Seville who used to wander around the town dressed to kill. Maria could remember allowing herself to once think that she was the woman in that song, that men, if they dared, stood and stared when she passed their way, and that one day would come a world-famous matador bearing a rose. But as she'd found in her 104 years of life, it never hurt to dream for something better. The ward was quiet today, the restless patients, some angry for a falser personality, some simply because they were scared by this new entity that had crept up upon the world while it had been partying. The new decade had offered so much hope for a fresh start. The ventilator upon which she had been attached had hurt her to begin with, forcing her body, which she suspected had long given up being told what to do, to try and continue breathing, 
Initially, she felt mild distress compared to the more eventful parts of her life. But now the ventilator's constant beeping was almost like a comfort blanket to her. It's presence that it was still there, helping her do, it, do its job to keep her alive. It reminded her of the harvesting machines that went around the streets of Seville, its mechanical claw clamping around the trees whilst it surrounded them with its nets before shaking them vigorously. The oranges would fall down into the net and be taken away before they fell down of their own accord and messed up the pavement. The oranges, bright but bitter, nevertheless made the most wonderful marmalade. She thought the machinery connected to her like this now, practical but with a mechanical noise, shaking her to continue her existence, lest she fall down of her own accord. Like the orange, she could come across as bitter, but she did have wonderful properties once put to proper use. The truth was that she loved Seville, liking nothing better than strolling along the Plaza de España in front of the all-inspiring architecture whilst the Guadalquivir snaked by, silently but ever-present. She also loved her country and thought of how much she had seen it changed, from a deeply secluded and brutal dictatorship through to a thriving Western democracy. She wasn't blind to its failures, but like any great country, system or family, you needed to continuously work at it and strive towards the pursuit of perfection that would never be reached, but would never do any harm in aiming for. This virus to her was just another problem to be overcome, albeit one that you couldn't see physically, but which all of us, whether directly or indirectly, could most definitely feel the impact of. It had come from a city that she had never even heard of until a few months ago, yet alone locate on a map, but she imagined how it contained people just like her, with her, their own aspirations, dreams and fears, and she wondered how many of them could have located Seville on a map too. It was scary, as things that are unknown are, and it had already wreaked death indiscriminately, not caring for another's age, colour, income or nationality. But while it was scary, she couldn't help feeling irritation at the Spanish youth, who were complaining about being locked away in their homes and not being able to go out. If they'd seen the things she had seen, she felt they would be glad to be asked to stay at home with their comforts. But maybe in its way, this was too much of a sweeping statement. She knew that for those that had never seen it, the presence of the army on the street asking you what you were doing outside felt like an alien, almost totalitarian concept, and that you could argue that locking people back into their houses under the notion of safety did breach long for human rights. Some went so far as to say the death of them. But if she'd learned anything at her advanced age, it was that things changed all the time, and that certainties of what you thought were immutable could be ripped away at any time. Death could come in the form of the passing away of physical beings, but also of ideas, ways of doing things, the notion of a society. She'd seen it within the last few days. The gentleman in the bed next to her had received a visit from a being that, in her half-drugged, dozing state, she initially thought was a person in a space suit or a Hascam outfit. The man was suffering appeared to, and appeared to be, whether involuntarily or not, struggling against the very machines that were there to save him. As she watched for a revival fatigue state, she saw the figure in the suit stop next to him and take his hand before her own world blacked out. The bed was empty when she awoke the next day. Both figures were gone. She wasn't sure if it was a mirage that she'd imagined or whether construing it as a mirage was a comfort blanket in which she drew around herself to stop her thinking that the man was probably dying, the person in his suit, his wife, relative or friend who had come to say goodbye. As she once again fell victim to the vile fatigue, the beeping on her machine quickening, memories of her life came back to her as it mixed with the drugs racing around the system. The town of Guernica in 1937 after the bombings, with people two days to even be described as shell-shocked, putting the best children on the boats in Bilbao. She was never quite sure if she had done the right thing. The Battle of the Alhambra Palace, Granada in 1940, where she was never sure if it was her that had fired the shot that had killed the nationalist. Looking a coup directly in the eye and vanquishing it in Valencia in 1981. The finding of her lover, the loss of a friend by an bomb, vanquished by the success of the Olympic Games in Barcelona in 1992. And her own dice were deaf in 2004, as she narrowly missed the connecting train that was targeted by Al-Qaeda in Madrid, which was ironic as she'd just returned from the Valle de los Cuadros, the Valley of the Fallen, which her brother, like many others, had perished building for Franco during the Civil War. But for all that, people would say she survived. Sometime later, the machine woke her from her musings of its bleep, continuing to scream that her life was just as important as everyone else. 
Yeah, she was the shady dame from Zaville. Nothing would distress her. And nobody would need, would need know that she did feel like sometimes she'd moved around the country, moving around the town, dressed to kill. She saw that she couldn't allow herself to succumb to something so cowardly that it wouldn't even show itself in true daylight. Besides, her country still had work to do on itself yet. She felt her body relax, her breathing stabilise, and the memories from the past of her long and eventful life, giving her the strength to fight once more. Besides, it wasn't even orange harvesting season yet, and she couldn't go before she had seen they were doing that properly and keeping the streets clean, obviously taking one of the oranges for herself from marmalade, of course. No, it was not her time to leave yet, and she knew that once more history, whether on the grand scale of sweeping events or in her admittedly own long but small history, had to triumph, trumpet that she was still there. She wouldn't have it any other way. Once again, she would survive. <laughs> really enjoyed that and uh, it was just as good in the abridged version I feel. Ah, now we have our lovely Chu Yin um, coming to perform for you. Um, she, I think a lot of you know her um, best for her work with Tai Chi. Um, she is a, U, a UK golden medalist and we're incredibly lucky to have her teaching Tai Chi for Global Fusion. Um, but she is also an amazing performer. I say the word performer because she acts, she, she can sing, she writes, she, she's just amazing. And she's our Chinese cultural ambassador. So, and she is currently uh, amassing work, her writing work about her, her life. So I can't wait for it to be finished and looking forward to hearing you now. Oh. Oh, hello everyone. Um, I am actually ever, ever so pleased to sit here and read to you a piece I wrote three years ago. But just before I read it, I really want to say a few words of praise of GFMA. I joined it probably 2013, so not one of the oldies, but when you think about it, it's really quite a long while ago. But over the last 10 months, I have been going through personal life events. I have no time to be creative. So I actually stopped out from the GFMA Writers Group uh, and all the activities apart from just teaching Tai Chi. But tonight, 10 months on, I just feel it's time to just show myself again. Woo! So, <laughs> if any of you got a chance, you really need to join the Writers Group. They are so wonderfully creative and clever people. I am a writer of academic uh, pieces, because I'm a midwife, for over 30 years. No time to be creative. But since I've joined GFMA, all my writing, as Jill has introduced me, saying, I'm trying to write so that my life story is going to be put into a book eventually. If not, one just go away. And either you, if you're lucky if someone remember you, if not, you're a shadow, and no shadow at all. So, this topic was, as I said, suggested by a GFMA member three years ago, and don't forget, 2020, we just had gone into the pandemic. And in fact, probably the first or second lockdown, which none of us knew about, and it was just shockingly different. So, and the topic is, in praise of friendliness. Very apt, actually. If you just think back three years ago, it was a strange time. So I'm going to read the piece. It's a bit sad, but I think it's worth remembering. Life isn't just all about laughs. Life is also about tears. But then when come tears, also there's happiness and joy. Now, June is not my favourite month. But June 2020 was absolutely a dreadful month. On the 6th of June 2020, I grieve for my soulmate, my dear husband, who passed on that date in 1998, 22 years ago. Then, beep, 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 beep. Radio 4, 
Week ending 26th of June 2020, number of deaths rose 8979 to 9140. Then follow the details of the R rate, if you remember. Associated death to CV19, etc., etc., etc. Then all of a sudden, Boris stopped the daily updates of deaths and infected cases from mid-June. Hippie hooray, less depressing, I thought. There may be numbers to politicians and statisticians, but stop. Each of those numbers stood for a human person. Someone's great-grandfather, great-grandmother, grandma, granddad, a mother, father, uncle, auntie, cousins, brothers, sisters, wife, husband, son, daughter, and friend. They belonged to a family who loved him or her and them. I did not realize this daily update in abstract numbers Rates and statistics of deaths were upsetting me so much until I had an email in that same week in June that started with, Hello, Chu Yin. This is Jan's niece. I have been trying to contact you. My heart beat faster. I caught my breath. I stopped reading that email and closed my eyes. I felt an ominous gloom descending on me. I forced myself to continue reading. I'm so sorry to let you know that my auntie, Jan, had passed on. I just screamed. I cried. I've lost a really lovely friend. We got to know each other just two years ago. This was the week before the 22nd anniversary of my soulmate, as I said, my dearest friend, my husband, passing. This piece of news arriving at this point in time, three months into lockdown, was absolutely devastating. After screaming and crying, I decided to deal with this sorrowful situation differently. Well, it is now four months since lockdown, when I am out exercising and or shopping for essentials. Do you remember that term? You're only allowed out to shop for essentials. I always step aside, away from the pavement, and let whoever it is, single person or family or a bubble of people to pass me. I then smile broadly and from my heart. Invariably, they will return with smiles and thank you as they step aside for them to pass. This I have found to be so much more emotionally positive and rewarding for me. Jan lived alone, like me, both of us very able and resilient in mind and body, but each of us a human person with emotions, heart and head that can become infected with sorrow and isolation. We were planning on the next meal together and it was Jan's turn to treat both of us. I should have rung her up and spoken with her more often, but was too busy planning my Zoom online Qigong and Tai Chi sessions. Show your friends you value them. Do not let time slip before it is too late. For me personally, being Chinese, I felt mounting unfriendliness towards me as the weeks went by in the pandemic, when everyone, but everyone, was talking about where the virus came from. China. As we descended further into lockdown, and the pandemic was confirmed, I felt mounting hostility, animosity, unfriendliness, hatred, antagonism, and the look that said, this is all your lot's fault, you Chinese. Go back where you come from. I may be Chinese looking, but I was born in Malaysia. I'm totally British. But hey, that minor ethnic detail did not interest these haters. I felt got at and very sensitive towards this unfriendliness. But wouldn't you? So now I have decided to stand aside, let others go ahead of me, demonstrating friendliness, goodwill and empathy. And I always wish them with a hello, have a great day. They invariably return my greeting, smile back, 
I feel friendlier and I am spreading friendliness and I feel happier. It was during the 2020 when we experienced the first, or was this the second lockdown? It seemed a long time ago. But that feeling of isolation, loneliness, utter hopelessness, hostility, I still remember well. Forgiving is easier than forgetting. Value yourself. Value each other. Value your friends, family, and value friendship. And just as a quick stop before I stop, on the 11th of November, 2023, GFMA organized a most incredible event in memory of Robert Fanshawe, soldier, actor, benefactor of GFMA, friend, writer, poet, and father. The other GFMA friends that spring to my mind is Jasmine John. I met years ago in GFMA through a spoken night at the Earl's, at the pub in Ch uh, Woolwich. They have each lived great lives, but now they are gone. Each of us has but one life. Am I appreciative of this gift of my life every second minute, hour of each day? The piece I chose to read this evening is not morbid. Sad, yes, very, very sad, but wait. If you're willing to learn from one life's events, sad or otherwise, one gathers strength but there is mindful work to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian, for that really powerful reminder of those important things. Um, that took me right back to that place. And, um, I'm very sad that you experienced that racism. It's so bad. You're right, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. I think she deserves another. <laughs> and thank you for reminding us about those two amazing um, members, both members of the GFMA Writers Group, who who are now no longer with us. Um, it's really important to remember them. Thanks so much. Um, and now we, we are so lucky to have um, Sheila McCallum, who is a long distance member of the writers group. She is a fantastic artist. Uh, behind her, you, you can see some of her paintings, which are, I mean, her house is like an art gallery, and um, her writing is, is just as good, and she's a philosopher as well, as you, will, you may or may not be able to tell, depending on what she's chosen to read tonight. Looking forward to hearing you, Sheila. Thanks so much for coming and joining us. Well, inspired by the group, by GFMA's writing group, I actually completed a novel. And this piece of writing, it could fall into the category of obsession or focus. I don't know. Anyway, I've called it musings on writing my novel. Wondrous was my homeward trek along the deserted shore road through the village, my way lit by the moon and a million stars, silence broken only by waves lapping over rocks. I marveled at how far I was from the outside world that seemed to be heading into dystopian nightmare. Pure illusion were these thoughts, for beneath the innocent beauty of the sea's silver sparkled surface, overfishing had already devastated nature's perfect balance, and that was frightening. I pondered on the intriguing notion of reality and illusion and wondered if writing a novel using not only pure make-believe, but magic too, I could lead my characters down an alternative path, 
away from the angst and greed-ridden madness of today towards a more spiritual state of readjustment to nature. The idea was compelling. So within the time span of change from the end of World War II into the 21st century, and using the device of a daughter's quest to find her lost father, I led Tanya from Greenwich to Soviet Leningrad to settle in the Cumbrian Lakes. As Mirabel, Tanya's daughter, becomes the main protagonist in the saga, she almost echoes Tanya's movements between Cumbria and London, even traveling to the now post-Soviet Russia. It was fascinating to invest life trajectories for these characters and those they encountered and recreate cities and landscapes I knew and loved in a virtual world which I control. Accidents and death in life often seem random. In my story, I could place such events according to my plot or character developments while I could still refer to actual happenings in the world to raise ethical dilemmas that arose through this period. As the plot became more eventful, everything seemed more real, yet utterly unreal. In raising my character's experiences to a level of magical real by spiking any apparent normality in their lives with interjections of magic and the paranormal, I place myself on a roller coaster. The omnipotence of the author became itself a magical conjuration. By transferring events, events and people from my 1970s Leningrad visit to my invented Tanya, I entered into my fictional masquerade at the outset. Even Tanya's Goldsmith's dissertation on Henry James' portrait of a lady was my own. My characters echo my love of this author and of Hugh Walpole, whose 17th century flame-haired gypsy girl I recreated as my latter-day heroine, Mirabel. Tanya's style of dress, as well as her and Mirabel's views on art, politics and philosophy, are mine too. This process of weaving my experiences and other intertextual elements into my fictional world made me aware that such make-believe becomes indistinguishable from all that is supposedly real. My engagement in this virtual world had revealed that everything, especially memories, are just fickle, elusive hauntings, reflecting nothing more than individual interpretations. Tanya and Mirabel do emerge as independent identities in the story, despite remaining vehicles of my exploration of ideas. Their lives and mine, I had deliberately woven into this complex web of events for this purpose. I added threads of mystery that wind through the tale only because such phenomena as synchronicity and the power of the tarot fascinate me. In my own life, the wayward leaps into unknown territories of experience that led to my present, I can analyze, cherish, or regret, but never change. Property prices prohibited my return to Cumbria when Mirabel needed funds to start her eco-based project and later to extend it to include more refugees, I could provide for her merely by a twist of fantasy. This is the transformative power of fiction. Bizarrely, these imagined lives exist only as long as the manuscript in which they appear is not destroyed, and that could be long after my brief life ends, which is a strange thought as I am here alive and they never were. I can alter my character's fates as long as I don't ossify the narrative in publication. Once I let others read my novel, the postmodern theory of the death of the author is proven as multiple understandings of the text will inevitably diminish my authorial hold on the meaning. What did I learn? 
I prefixed the novel with a quote from Baudrillard. I came full circle and ended with the same quote. The image is the reflecting of a basic reality. It masks and perverts a basic reality. It masks the absence of a basic reality. It bears no relation to any reality whatsoever. Finally, does any of this really matter in the ever flickering uncertainty of the present or future? This morning, as reports of increasingly brutal war horrors were transmitted into my living room, I watched a trawler still wrecking the ocean bed of the Merle that sustains all sea life. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, that was, there's a lot to think about in that. And there were some parallels um, with uh, Constanza's piece of writing, I thought. Um, yes, I felt that. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yes. Um, and uh, Sheila's novel is, it, I, I still, or in the writers group, haven't heard the whole thing, but um, we're, we're, I'm really looking forward to being able to read it. And um, yes. That's it. That was a sad reminder of what's what's happening in the world today, unfortunately. Yes, even in a place like this. In the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But thank you so much. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> and uh, now we come to our last performer, um, who is no stranger to Global Fusion Music and Arts. Um, she is actually, oh no, sorry, second to last, because we've got Yama, who is, <laughs> is also no stranger. <laughs> Third to last. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm, my maths is not my strong point. <laughs> um, so Yama it actually lives in Greenwich, and she is an amazing writer and actor, and um, she's actually appeared in live... Um, poetry, spoken word, and music nights when we used to, before the pandemic, always had them at the pub in Woolwich. And she's also appeared in uh, a Martin Luther King play for us. She is a brilliant singer as well as a writer. But today she's going to uh, read from her book, which I can't wait to hear. <laughs> Okay, this is petrifying, sharing my, um, my autobiographical novel because I've been working on it for over 10 years and still I'm not happy with it. But I just thought, you know what? There's no such thing as perfection, only good enough. So here goes. Prologue. It's called A Beautiful Warrior. This is an autobiographical novel that acknowledges the fact that everything on this divine planet does have a purpose. Don't you ever give up. It ain't over till it's over. Take a walk on the wild side, wake up and speak your truth. A reputation for ruthlessness isn't such a bad thing. It can make one credible. Frank Sinatra says the best revenge is massive success. The real power lies in the freedom to speak, to kick yourself out of your box. Life is too short to be miserable. Tell your story, be happy and be free. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. 
What gain has the worker from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done for the beginning to the end. I know there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. And that's from Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 to 13 from the Apocryphal Version. <laughs> Chapter 1. Fear. Once upon a time in Mosley, deep in the heart of the West Midlands, I was born in Sorrento Hospital and sent home to a cramped, vermin-infested bedsit, no bigger than a double bedroom. My parents left Ghana, West Africa, for a hope of employment and a job for life during the wind rush. With blood, sweat and tears, they bought their own house. It was not comfortable being black then. It still isn't. Some laws may have changed, but the underlying currents of slavery and inherent hatred remain hidden deep underground. My mother worked 12-hour shifts in Cadbury's Bourneville for a quarter of a century. There is a lot about childhood I do not recall. What happened to me? This is my story. I must tell it my way. It is one way of dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. My father was an intense, moody and mean man who seemed incapable of genuine affection. My mum deserved so much better than to just exist and tolerate abuse. I understand what my mother endured now she is gone. I have been married twice and take full responsibility for attracting cold-hearted men into my life whose mindless actions nearly killed me. Nevertheless, I have matured and see the gift in the pain. I regret none of it and have learned there is a lesson to learn inside every single experience. On bad days, depression circles overhead like a dark angel waiting to carry away my soul. On other days, I just go with the wind feeling fabulous. All that holds me back is self-belief. I have no option but to fight. Rage has festered inside me for too long. I have been ashamed to tell anyone the truth. I kept it to myself until I could not take it any more. I have many reasons to be angry, but I refuse to let wrath have control over me any longer. Life and the cosmos constantly conspire for change. Resistance is futile. What will be, will be. So I surrender to the flow of now. After all, what is the point of silence? There is no good reason to keep quiet. I must focus on what is important right now, for now is all I have. Chapter 2. Responsibility. I have been frightened for so long that I do not know what it is I am afraid of anymore. I used to fear the dark, but now I cherish any free moment to languish in obscurity. In the darkness, there is no light. I am blinded only by what lies inside me, deep inside my mind. This is just the beginning of my fight for freedom. What if people do not like me or have something against what I have to say? Maybe they will not approve of the colour of my skin. Fear has stopped me for way too many moons now. I have allowed it to make me look backwards instead of moving forwards. I learn how to put on a brave face, how to pretend to my detriment. How I feel does not always show through my mask. I have become adept at hiding my true feelings from the world. I have so many dreams and goals. Every small step gets you a little closer to the achievement of your goals, they say. I do not want to do this alone anymore. I denied the suffering and have been avoiding things that hurt. I reveled in self-destruction. I fell prey to the horrors of losing loved ones to death. 
Logically, I know it is part of life, but damn, it hurts to lose my precious mother in such tragic and suspicious circumstances. It has been over a decade since she passed, but I still cry on bad days. The way she left was not right. I have been holding on to the pain way too tight. Post-traumatic stress disorder makes me avoid crowds. I am an entrepreneur with businesses to run. There are the accounts, receipts, and way too much red tape bureaucracy for my liking. Although I am petrified, I must get through this. I have been afraid of enjoying myself too much since mum died. I feel guilty for living on. I guess that's the nature of survivor's guilt. How is this possible? What if I have it all wrong? What do I do if people laugh or do not care much for my art? What if I am the butt of jokes and ridicule? I have been so close to the edge many times before, but I held on for dear life. I will forever fight for survival. I may break down and lose the plot from time to time, but it is the risk I am willing to take to make my life count. Every day is different and I will take each moment at a time. I refuse to listen to the negative voices that tell me to fear. I will not stay locked up in a self-imposed mental prison. Am I educated or skilled enough to write my own life story? It is time to share my story. As gruesome memories surface, I will give them a voice. Otherwise, it festers and makes things much worse. Expression frees me from the voices partying in my head. Time is a healer. And I have found the blankness of the sheet to be my confidant. Corruption tends to seek retribution for injustice. However, justice has its course. I am a vessel of divine energy. No one can tell me who to be, but I will be myself. I have had enough of false pretenses. I acknowledge phases, patterns, seasons, and how different cycles of the moon affect the way I feel. Oh, how the stars in the sky determine my temperament. I declare my history to the world so it no longer haunts me. Goddesses fight demons and human faces hide evil while the innocent remain unnoticed. It feels like I am driving down a country lane in the black of night through thick, dense fog with nothing but cat's eyes along the road to lead the way. The path ahead is not clear, but I trust my guides. I surrender to my force, my ancestry, and finally acknowledge my pain. Hardship has blessed me with the power of resilience. Nothing worth having in life comes easy. All I need is my voice. Although, I know how feelings cannot kill me. At one point, I thought they would. The pain sank in more profound than the ocean when I doubted my ability to stay alive. This is my new life. I will stay alive and thrive as I turn upon the page to reclaim my life. Life goes on. The dead cannot return. My mother deserved, my mother deserved to die a much better death. Despite diabetes, inadequate medication and third world conditions. She may have survived if father took her to the hospital sooner. She pleaded for a doctor for over 12 hours then died on the backseat of my father's car miles away in Ghana. It was too late. Nothing could ever bring her back. Both of my parents went on holiday together, but only one returned. I still don't know what happened on the last day of my mother's life. I was not there. I see her in the brightest star, watching over and guiding me, along with my ancestors. I have been like a ship on a tormented sea. Letting go of the past is extremely painful but it is necessary in the pursuit of freedom. My roots go much deeper than the oldest tree. My nature is the truth and it is part of me. I want to know my history, so I ready myself for this journey with my West African heritage and a model of healing that suits my DNA. I am a woman and I am black. I have been abused, raped and traumatized on many levels. Now, I am on a mission to discover my reality, the blood that runs through my veins, my birthright, my vagina, my legacy. 
There is an open door, a light way to travel when all seems lost. Depression exists. I took control and it took control and left me isolated without parole. Why punish me for wanting to be free? I still have a tiny flicker remaining, a glimpse of determination, persistence, and a ton of conviction. Normality is subjective. Wisdom shows me daily what I must do to be happy. I am a beautiful warrior, a survivor. I am strong. I feel vulnerable, but never weak. When the key no longer turns, it is time to change the lock and throw away the key. I am taking no prisoners. I will be ruthless as I need to go back in time to figure out the mystery of who I am. I set my bags down today, right now, after this word. I exchange my frown for a smile and burning rage for peace. Change is constant. What is heartache after all? Adjustment always unsettles me. It turns the inside out. I Am I ready? Shall I commence? I am giving myself permission to be human again, to feel once more. Though loneliness threatens me like a savage beast scavenging for a tasty morsel, I shall proceed. I would love to shut off the vibes, but without them I am nothing. Survival is my challenge and success is my quest. No matter what I do, the sunshine always comes up in the morning. It brings a beautiful cleansing of the soul, the blessing of a new day. I release all that no longer serves my higher purpose, like the tree outside my bedroom window. I was pruned, I was naked and bare. Now suddenly, here I am again, vibrant and full of green leaves, blooming stronger than ever before. I had to hit rock bottom to ask the real questions demanding answers from my past. Denial called my attention to the now, the truth of my experience. Baby shit stinks just like anxiety, yet it must be cleaned. I see my path and the way I need to tread. However, I worry I will give up when I am just about to break free. Trauma once wreaked havoc on my physical body and mental health. Horrors have long passed, yet my body remembers them in every muscle, cell and neural pathway. Breathing is my privilege and my battle for a simple life. I give way to the prospect of true love, I know that if my heart breaks again, it can heal. Thank you. Oh, so thank much, you. Yerma. Oh, thank you so much, Yerma. That was absolutely amazing. So powerful and so clear. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all of those. So therapeutic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next uh, performer is absolutely the heart and soul of Global Fusion Music and Arts and most of the time she spends promoting the work of other people apart from occasionally on blues nights when she performs but um, it's lovely to hear Louisa reading some of her writing for a change. So um, please welcome Louisa Lamarchan. <laughs> right. <laughs> as I'm the techno person as well, I have to be over there and then quickly dash over here. So I can just see myself there. And there I am, yes, good. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. Right, so this is, um, I'm going to be doing something completely different. Uh, this is a thing, a piece called Harry Fingers. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, you, you're sitting across the room from me, too. <laughs> okay, this is Harry Fingers. Harry Fingers was a professional criminal. He had spent a lifetime in and out of prison, and at this moment he was in a box in a van being transported to yet another prison. It didn't matter to him where he was because Harry Fingers was dying. He knew it, the doctors knew it, and so did the wardens. He might get out on his next parole hearing on compassionate grounds, but that was six months time. 
and he, he knew it was only a matter of weeks, maybe days, even hours, before he was gone. Suddenly, the van stopped abruptly, and he was thrown against his seatbelt. There was lots of shouting and noise, and the next thing he knew, he knew, the door was opened and a young guy he recognised as Julian, the art forger, was unlocking his handcuffs and saying, Come on, Pops, time to go. What's on? Harry asked in a confused, blurry way. Someone has kindly arranged an escape, replied the young man. For me? Harry asked, even more confused. No, for that computer geek over there. Apparently, he knows where all the bodies are buried, in very high places. So they've kindly laid on to this to whisk him out of the country. Mind you, how long they will let him live is another question. What the fuck are you doing in there? Get your asses out here, bellowed a voice from the door. And what are you doing bringing that old geezer? This is my friend, Harry Fingers, one of the greatest safe crackers in the business. He's a legend. I don't care if he's Harry Bloody Hill. Get the fuck out here now, the tough military man shouted. The next thing Harry knew, he was speeding off in a car, followed by five other vehicles. He was so, it was so efficiently and so efficient, and the speed and everything was took had taken place. <laughs> Sorry about that. The military man in the front of the car said, "What are you going to do with him now?" In a harsh and harassing voice, this made Harry feel very threatened and somewhat apprehensive about what would happen next. "Don't worry, we can go to my uncle Lenny," says. His dad's about the same size as Harry, and we can soon get him kitted out. Then we can put him in a taxi, and he can go wherever he wants, laughed Julian. The military man grunted. <coughs> I'm Julian, said the young man. They, <coughs> they have, they have, <coughs> I'm Julian, said the young man. They have to look after me, because I shared a cell with Paul the computer guy, and he's told me some quite interesting stories. But don't worry, I will make sure you'll be okay. Simon was a plumber, and he was good, and he did well for himself. He had his own business, he had a family, and really enjoyed his work. Today, Simon was in the kitchen of a nice old lady, changing her taps. He had worked here before, and well, she wasn't exactly old, maybe in her 60s, which these days is the new 40s says me, because I'm 70-odd, as she has often told him. He was just talking about the new kitchen taps, and do you, do you mean this, sorry, just taking the kitchen taps out of the box, when in walks an old man and says, where's Mary? Do you mean Mrs. Collins? Simon asked. Yes, my wife, the old man replied. Suddenly, he slumped down on the floor, leaned exhausted against the wall. Simon rushed over to Harry and asked in a concerned voice, Are you all right? No, I'm dying. Where's Mary? She just popped out to get some shopping, reassured Simon. Who are you? asked the old man. I'm Simon, the plumber. I'm just here ch to change some taps for your wife. You must be Harry. Oh, yes, Harry, said Harry weakly. Can you do something for me? Yes, replied Simon, anything. Can you unscrew the panel behind the second unit? Inside you'll find two boxes. Bring the small one out, please. Simon did as he was asked and brought the box to Harry. Harry held up the box. I made this, he said. It's a perfect replica of one of the toughest safes you can ever get. The only difference is it's I get in the back door. Harry played around with the box for a couple of minutes pressing places and twisting and turning the box. Then suddenly the box opened at the back. Harry giggled and lifted out a pair of castanets and started to play. All I ever wanted was to have enough money to buy us a small villa in Spain and spend the rest of our lives there. I love it there. When I wasn't in prison, I've done, and I'd done one or two jobs, we would go, Mary and me, it was wonderful, he paused. I didn't set out to be a criminal. Life just took me that way. The war was over. My dad came back to, from the forest, and he was never the same. He drank. He was violent. By the time I was born, he had completely lost it. 
and he was killed one night walking home from the pub. Best thing for him really, for all of us I think, especially my mum. We lived in the East End, bombed out, no real future for us kids. The white boys and the gangs, they had been nipped, uh, they'd been, oh God I can't read my own writing. Um, They'd been in the black market, prostitution, during the war, and afterwards they became the organised crime. And it was like a magnet for young men, with no war to fight. I was not into violence. I'd seen enough of it. I liked safes. I'd learned my trade from the best. Safe Sammy. Not because he was safe to be around, but because when it came to explosives, well, Sammy knew just what he was doing. He was the best and I became his prodigy. We built safes, we stole safes, we cracked them. If the new one came out, we would work on it. Like the youngsters today with their computers and phones and gadgets. I really miss safe Sammy. But he did a good job and he had a good innings. I'm not making excuses. We're all responsible for our actions. Don't do the crime if you don't want to do the time. But then everything went wrong. We were doing a job. I, I promised Mary that I wouldn't do any more. But I thought, just one more. Then we can buy that villa and, and live in Spain there. Anyway, I was cracking the safe and we had a youngster with us. He was determined to make a name for himself. A security guard came in and he shot him. The judge, he, he wanted to make an example of us all. But I had no idea this young buck had a gun. That. That was never the deal. I'm a craftsman, not a gangster. All this time, Simon had been listening and noticed Mary standing in the doorway. Harry hadn't heard her and just carried on his story. Tears welled up in Harry's eyes and he sobbed. I'm so sorry, Mary. I just wanted to give her so much. She ended up with a failure like me. She could have done so much better. With that, he closed his eyes and Mary rushed over. He's, he, he's all right, she said. He's just exhausted, and she kissed him on the forehead. Simon pulled out the other box from the other safe and watched Harry, and had watched Harry, the same things in the safe. And when it opened, Simon Mary gasped. Inside were large wads of 50 pound notes. Harry laughed. Our villa in Spain. But then Mary became very serious. You can't stay here. They'll come for him soon. And I don't want him dying in prison. Don't worry, said Simon. I have a place and a plan. But he will never make it out of the country. He's too weak, Mary pleaded. Don't worry. If the mounted can't come to Mohammed, then the mount if the Mah mountain won't come to Mohammed, then the mountain will have to come to Mohammed. Well, oh, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When Harry awoke, the first thing he noticed was the heat. Then the familiar sounds of shikadas, crickets. He was on a sun lounger by a table with an umbrella over his head. Mary came over with a plate of delicious smelling paella. Did you make, did we make it to Spain, he asked. Yes, it's so lovely here. And gave him a glass of Rioja. With the fragrance sent him back all the way of the wonderful holidays they had. I know that you're a villain, but you're my villain, and you've all and I've always loved you no matter what. Harry sighed and closed his eyes and said, I'm feeling a bit tired. I think I will have a little siesta. His breathing became more and more shallow, and then one long sigh. He passed his past, said Mary. You know you're going to get into a lot of trouble. For harbouring a criminal. I know, she sobbed and laughed. Thank you so much for making this happen. Perhaps you should turn off the sun lamps now. It's been a pleasure and such a privilege to make the dream come true for the legend that is Harry Fingers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louisa. I love that story. That's great. <laughs> it's got humour, but it's also very poignant. Um, I think we should give her another clap. Yeah.
Okay, we're coming to near the end of the evening now, but um, we have one other wonderful performer, and she's performing all the way from Bristol, although she has visited us um, in London, and we hope she's going to do so again uh, in not too long. Um, this is Ant Antoinette Clark Akalane. She is a, a fantastic writer and a poet, and um, I can't wait to hear what you've got to say today, Antoinette. That, thank you very much, uh, Jill, and good evening, everybody. Well, I had um, a kind of a funny moment, really, because I had three bits of um, things which I couldn't decide what to present tonight. But finally, I decided what I wanted. Um, I did a bit of research on a little known woman in Barbados. And this is the bit of research about her. Her name is Rachel Pringle. She was born actually as Rachel Lauder in, 19, in 1753. She died in 1791. She was the mulatto enslaved daughter of William Lauder, a white shopkeeper and his enslaved African mistress. Now the word mulatto is a very old word now, it's no longer used. It means mixed race, but 50% real black and 50% white. That was what it is, but obviously it's a decadent word. We, we no longer use it. Rachel's father, William Lauder, was a Scottish literary forger who falsely tried to prove that the English poet, John Milton, was a plagiarist. His deception was discovered, and after many failed attempts to clear his name, he fled in disgrace to Barbados. And that was around 1750. Here, he became the headmaster of a grammar school in Bridgetown, which is the capital of Barbados. In 1762, he was dismissed from the school for incompetence. Following this, he opened a shop in Bridgetown, uh, which he ran with his enslaved African mistress, which is Rachel's mother, and possibly Rachel herself, because Rachel was by then nine years old. William is reported to have died in abject poverty in 1771 in Barbados at the age of 61. Rachel was then about 18 years old. There is an etching, which I, I, I tried to see if I could show you here on the, uh, on the Zoom, but I couldn't, I couldn't show you. But this etching was done by a poet called Thomas Rawlingson, and he did it five years after Rachel's death. And this shows racial father as depicted, you know, from the back, facing a young image of Rachel, um, who stands before him. And then another older image of Rachel as she was before she died, very fat and, you know, ob ob obese, in, in fact. Uh, and, and also a man who was Captain Pringle. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about him later. And uh, he was looking through the window. So that was the etching done by this poet, Thomas Rawlinson, which hangs in the Barbados Museum. Now, William is shown as old, overweight, double chin, with small, swollen legs and gray haired. That is in the etching. His clothes are tattered and he is supported by a cane in his right hand. His photo, the photo suggests that William had mobility issues, possibly arthritis. His swollen legs might be due to a condition called elephantiasis or Barbados leg. Now, elephantiasis is a condition, uh, is a, an edema, and is a condition which is due to blockage of the lymphatic system, which is produced by uh, parasites from the mosquito blocking up the little tubules in the lymphatic system. Now, William Tattered Clothes suggests that he uh, was in poverty and he was possibly a miser as well. Unlike the pantocracy classes in Barbados, William would not have benefited from reparation from slavery because most of the rich plantocracy people in Barbados, they had reparations when they had to give up their slaves. William only had that one slave, so he, he didn't get anything at all.
Now, Rachel uh, has been reported to have blossomed into a beautiful girl, very uh, sophisticated. And her father, who was her enslaver, was reported to attempted to rape her on several occasions. He finally ordered that she should be whipped for rejecting him. But fortunately for Rachel, she was saved by the, the man's cousin, who was called Captain Pringle. He just took the whip away from Rachel's father, and he took Rachel away. He later fell in love with Rachel. Now, William brought um, a court case against Captain Pringle, claiming that Pringle stole his goods. Because in those days, the slaves were regarded as goods or property. They weren't regarded as people. So what Pringle did, he purchased uh, um, Rachel from uh, William, her father, at a very high price. Rachel and Pringle became lovers and Pringle manumated her. Now manumated mean freed her from slavery. And he provided her with a house in Bridgetown, St. Michael, that's in Barbados, which she, con which she converted into a brothel called the Royal Naval Hotel. Rachel's hotel catered to naval and military personnel stationed in Barbados, offering them various types of hospitality, including sexual gratification. During Rachel's time, it was not uncommon for white slave masters, white migrants from Britain, and white British naval and military personnel to seek se sexual gratification with enslaved and ex-enslaved women, particularly those of light complexions. One of Rachel's patron, patrons was Prince William Henry, Duke of Clarence. He became King William the Fourth. Can you imagine that? And lots of people don't know this. So this little known history um, of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Ireland and the King of Hanover from the 26th of June, 1930, uh, at the age of 64 until his death. Which, and he died at the age of 71. On Prince, on Prince William's second visit to Barbados, uh, he had his 49 regiment with him because he was called, at that time, he was called the Sailor Prince. He used to sail quite a lot. So he brought the 49th reg, uh, regiment with him and he visited Rachel's hotel and he got drunk. He and his group got drunk and they smashed up the hotel. So Rachel sent the prince a bill for all the damages that he, he and his, his team caused. And the prince sent, it, sent her so much money that she was able, she was able to you know, refurbish the hotel in a very grand style. The same prince was very so, so popular in Barbados that up to today, there's a street still named, I've got a photograph of it, Prince William Henry Street. And that is in Bridgetown in Barbados. Now, Rachel's relationship with Captain Pringle ended when she bore a quadroon baby. Now, a quadroon means only a quarter black and three quarter white. So they look white. Most of, we have many Barbadians who are called white in Barbados, but they're actually quadroon. You know, they, they've got, you know, that quarter, quarter amount of blood in them, black blood in them. So um, she bore this quadroon baby from another mulatto woman. Uh, when when uh, the guy, uh, Captain Pringle, returned from one of his travels, she presented the baby to him as their baby, and he was delighted about it. And then the woman came back for her child. And of course, Pat, Captain Pringle nearly had a heart attack. He left Barbados and he never returned. I think he went off to other Caribbean islands and then other things as well before his death. Now, after this, Rachel added the name of Paul Green to her name. It is unclear if Paul Green was Rachel's subsequent lover and benefactor, because all the research I did, I couldn't find out, you know, whether he was her lover or what. Anyway, she added that name to him. So I, I put here, I shall refer to people of European and African descent as light skin rather than mulatto now, you know, because that term is actually uh, outdated. Mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, mixed race, half gas, red skin, mixed blood, colored, 
all of these terms. I'll just refer to them as light-skinned people. Rachel is reported to have uh, unmercifully and viciously beat one of her enslaved sex workers on her head with the heel with the heel of a shoe, then threw her down and attempted to stamp on her head. All because the woman failed to bring Rachel enough money from her sex earnings. The woman has been who was reported to uh, have been saved from death by two naval officers. This example infers that Rachel's personal experience and knowledge about the ill treatment meted out by some slave owners to their enslaved people failed to stimulate Rachel's empathetic uh, reasoning, uh, uh, reasonings. Rather, she adopted and perpetuated the worst behavior of the white slave owners. Rachel was the first woman of African uh, origin to own a hotel in Barbados. I was the first, I'm calling her a black now, I was the first black female hoteler in history. Her shrewdness, hard work and resourcefulness made her a successful business entrepreneur. And she rose to prominence and amassed a huge estate worth at that time 2,900 pounds. We were talking about in the 18th century, which is about 30,000 in today's money. Some of her assets include 30, 38 slaves, houses, goods, furnishes, jewelry, and other items. In those days, demand for services created by the trade and business activities, which was military and naval, produced several opportunities like tavern keeping, hotel and lodging houses, brothels, and similar roles, which became available to many light-skinned women. Despite this, despite the success of Rachel's business, they were not considered respectable by her white peers. William Lauders, Rachel's father, was well educated. He was previously a headmaster, but he did not invest in Rachel's education at all. She was illiterate and did not contribute anything to her own story. So we will never know what she thought and felt about herself or the Barbados society she, she lived in. Rachel's story has been taught in Barbadian schools and sung uh, in lyrics by the Barbadian Calypso Calypsonian group, the Merry Men. Something, Rachel Pringle, you make my whole body jingle, the way you walk, the way you talk. Rachel Pringle, you make my whole body jingle, I like your style, the way you smile. And it goes on and on. It's the Barbados Calypso, Calypso. Rachel's light complexion offered her opportunities and advantages that were not easily available, available to the black, her black complexion peers. This discrimination, term colorism, developed during slavery and is still practiced in Barbados today and other areas, as well as other areas. And I've quoted myself here. I, all this is reference, and I've quoted myself because I did research on colorism for my dissertation. Enslaved and, and light-skinned people were regarded as more beautiful and intelligent than the black complexion pairs. They were usually given higher work, such as housework, craftsmanship, and the like, unlike their black compatriots who were assigned to heavy field work in the hot sun. And that again is quoted. Many had opportunities to be manumitted and had access to education, like Rachel. Rachel's effigy and etchings shows her wearing a long dropped gold earrings in her ears, a gold chain around her neck with a locket, which has a picture of Captain, Captain Pringle in it. She has colored stone encrusted in gold rings on her fingers, excluding the thumbs. These features suggest a person of considerable wealth. Both her eff eff effigy and etchings display Rachel as grossly obese, which suggests that she had medical, a medical condition or she had access to resources. Rachel's arms and hands appear edematous. Her left hand is curved backward in an awkward position, as though it is affected by paralysis. Could she have had a right-sided hemiplegic stroke? I ask. The answer to these questions are silenced in history. Two days before Rachel's death, she made a will providing a manumission for six of her light-skinned slaves. 
she bequeathed the remaining slaves to those she had manumitted. She died in, in 1791 at the age of 38, which is relatively long, young by today's standards. Her body is interred in St. Mary's Church uh, Cemetery. And again, I've got the photograph, but, you know, um, I can't show it. I did not find any records detailing uh, Rachel's health status, nor the cause of her death. From her etch effigy and etchings, however, one could conclude that she suffered mobility issues and she might have had circulatory and respiratory problems. Rachel was childless. She yearned to have a child and borrowed someone else's baby, pretending it was hers and Captain Pringles. She was sexually active from a young age and had numerous sexual encounters. It can be assumed that she was not free from sexually transmitted diseases, which she could, which could have impacted negatively on her ability to have children. In figure five and six, Rachel appeared to have Sampaku eyes. Now Sampaku eyes is when you see the whites underneath somebody's eyes, you know, uh, you have you have the pupil and the iris, and then the, the white show, and that's that is supposed to be a very bad sign. Um, Michael Jackson, if you look at Michael Jackson's later photographs, you will see he had some back eyes. Same thing with Doris Day. This feature is said to be associated with health and tragedy, uh, ill health and tragedy. Rachel was so popular that her image was sketched. On, on scrim shoes. Now, scrim shoes in, in the old days, when people when they, when people used to catch whales, they used to use whale bones to write things on, and her, her etching is on a lot of these scrim shawls. Uh, and one of them is actually um, held in the Queen's, the Queen's reserves. So that shows how popular Rachel was at that, at, at that time. After Rachel's death, the Royal Naval Hotel continued to flourish for decades under, under the auspices of other ex-enslaved light-skinned women, the first of whom was Nancy Clark, who eventually emigrated to England and died there in 1812. The Royal Naval Hotel was destroyed by fire in 1881. The foregoing is an example of how enslaved and ex-enslaved light-skinned women in the slave-owning society in Barbados use their agency to obtain privileges, opportunities, and to secure manumissions for themselves and others. Rachel was the worst, world's first known black female hoteler. Thank you. so much Antoinette. Um, I think that's the first time we've heard any of your research writing so that was very special. Yes it is actually. Yeah. Yeah thank uh, you very much. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. That's Let's right. <laughs> another... Oh it's been a wonderful just have, evening. Just... We yeah. have, we've had an amazing uh, group of people and I'd just like to thank all of you so much for performing. Um, we've heard Emily Sherris, Andrew L. Boyd, Constanza Maria, David Braybrook, and uh, Chu Yin Laws, Sheila McCallum, Louisa Martian, Yemma Sekmet-Mart, and Antoinette clark Akalane, and myself. Um, I did say you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all, uh, the lovely audience, um, for joining us tonight. And um, if anybody has missed it who you know would like to listen to it, it should be on YouTube and Facebook very shortly. GFMA TV. On GFMA TV on, on uh, um, YouTube. And we just want to end with an advert for our, our Christmas party, which is going to be on December the 17th at the Earl of Chatham pub at a blues night. And there will be delicious African food there. So come along and join us and um, help celebrate the, the year that's just gone and look forward to the new year coming up. 
and have a lovely evening, everybody. <laughs>